Buenas, soy Ana Miguez, and I don't speak Spanish. But uh, I am, uh, as mentioned, lead UI developer at Field Intelligence, where we take care of uh, fields, uh, supply chains for pharmaceuticals. So basically, we help uh, to transfer medical um, products to, to the uh, pharmacies or in between other places. I also hold title of Google Developer Expert in the area of web technologies. Uh, with the uh, web performance uh, specialty. And my title for, for the talk today is Web Performance Optimizations for Harsh Conditions. So, as you figured, we're going to talk about web performance for the first time today, but I would rather want to speak about user experience connected to the web performance as experience um, in harsh daily conditions. So let's start with getting all on the same page. Web performance refers to the speed in which web pages are downloaded and displayed on the user's web browser. So this is a very short uh, definition of web performance so that we all know what we're talking about. And the reason I'm doing this talk is because um, I've been speaking about web performance, been interested in web performance, tried to optimize web performance uh, for many years, and since I started to work for this new, uh, on this new project, my perspective has changed a lot. So the, uh, our, our application is targeted towards emerging markets, and uh, currently we're working with Nigerian and Kenyan markets. And the conditions there are completely different, and I realized that a lot of things that have been sort of preaching or talking about when it comes to metrics and articles they do not apply uh, at all to, to the situation, unfortunately. And you might say, well, why should you care? Uh, Africa is far, I'm not, I mean, not that far. But uh, you're not working probably on a project that is targeted towards uh, African markets. Um, but, well, you never know. I also live in Poland. I never thought I'll be working on a project like that. And here I am just going to Nigeria now and then. And, um, testing things out in the field. But it's not only a problem for, uh, for users that are in places like Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. This is a problem for anyone that is, for example, using an old device, uh, is located in a rural area with no stable collection at all times, or is using an enterprise app that is hard to optimize on a daily basis. Think of syncing loads of data every day, um, for example, dashboards uh, or some, some, like some enterprise app, basically. So, as mentioned, um, I realized that um, the, most of the information about web performance that we're seeing daily is um, unfortunately not applicable to the situations. Thank you, I have one already. Um, and this is because most web performance metrics and resources are developed with a privileged user in mind. And it makes total sense, because when you think about this, um, they're most likely also developed by privileged users, people who are on a daily basis using a good laptop, have a great connection, uh, probably are located in the US, in Europe, parts of Asia, uh, uh, as far as we know it. And when you start researching, you, you have these uh, this examples uh, in front of you. For example, when you, when you look at the documentation around uh, what are like the good timings for certain uh, performance metrics? You notice that the timing that's uh, shown is uh, um, is put uh, for the average mobile uh, average mobile hardware. So like already we're talking about average hardware, not maybe less um, prone, to, uh, less. Uh, Fortunate hardware, let's say. Or if you see at this, uh, if you take a look at the stats that are uh, basically prompting you uh, to optimize web performance and show the gains of optimizing web performance, you see that most of them will speak about the revenue um, and optimizing for use cases in in which people usually already have quite fast uh, connection and it's just like a slight difference for them. And unfortunately. For some reasons, uh, for some users, the good web performance is not achievable at all, not at any time. They are not as privileged as we may think. 
And to support this, I wanted to uh, bring a really good quote from the uh, article about uh, misconceptions about caching uh, JavaScript. So at a high level, there are two primary performance bottlenecks of the web. First is networking, which is the round trip time to acquire an asset or data payload from a remote server. And the second is end user device compute. The amount of time, uh, the amount of computational overhead required of the, uh, on the end user's device. So let's start with the networking. As you might notice, the networking uh, definition is very similar to the definition of latency, which is generally considered to be the amount of time it takes from when a request is made uh, by the user to the time it takes for the response to get back to that user. So basically, a uh, user opens a website on the, on the device, and then there's a request that needs to make its way to the server, wherever the server is, and then get back to, to the user. And the problem is that the latency in most parts of Africa is really high. When I say most parts, it's uh, without South Africa and some northern African countries, but most sub-Saharan Africa, like the middle of Africa, second biggest continent uh, on Earth, um, it, there's just like a big problem of latency, and it's because of the lack of in infrastructure. For example, there's, uh, there's not that many CDNs, not that many hubs. And I saw a statistic that, uh, for example, for Nigeria, uh, around 90% of websites are ho hosted overseas in the US. So you can imagine that uh, you pull up your phone and like, the bits of data need to come from, from the US to uh, such, a, uh, such a long way. So this is a physical barrier, and it means that like, things just take longer time. And unfortunately, high latency means long time to first byte, in short, TTFB. Uh, this is a metric that tells us how long it takes for like, the first bits of information to hit the user's device. And to quote Harry Roberts, who's a web performance consultant, while a good time to first byte doesn't necessarily mean you have a fast website, a bad time to first byte almost certainly guarantees a slow one. So as you can see, you have a guaranteed slow experience from the start because of um, how long it takes to, to get the data from this uh, far away data centers. The second part of our quote was talking about end user device compute. So uh, now to quote Adios Mani from Google, time spent in past compile can be often at, uh, two to five times as long on phones as on desktop. And uh, I have a really, really nice screenshot here. You might not be seeing exactly what's in there, and I know it's very bright and hurting your eyes, so I won't show it for long. But basically, the better the device, the, the shorter parse compile time, and the, the less fortunate device, let's call it that, the longer the parse compile time. Um, so what is the parse compile? Uh, after the data hits, OK, I was switch the slide, I see people just with the eyes like that. <laughs> so after, the, after this data hits the device, uh, after like all these latency problems and all, and it took long enough already, longer than we were used to it. Also, um, the, uh, the, device, uh, the browser needs to make sense of this data. Like It needs to interpret what, what we're having there and um, be able to show the user uh, the image of the website. So the lower computational power of the device, the longer it will take. It's quite logical. And unfortunately, the, the problem is with devices used. Spoiler. And um, I have a really nice quote. So Nigeria is considered a mobile-first market where infrastructure and online usage development skipped wide-ranging desktop PC adoption and went straight to mobile internet usage via inexpensive smartphones instead. So as you can see, we're mentioning here the inexpensive smartphones. One of the most uh, popular um, brands uh, in, in Africa is called Techno, and this is Chinese uh, Chinese brands that um, produces smartphones. And when they produce these smartphones, there are like two, two qualities uh, in mind. F first, that it's cheap, 
and the second one that uh, it has long-lasting battery, and not much more apart from that matters. Um, the problem with battery is that there's a lot of power outages, and um, if you, for example, don't have a generator, you might not be able to charge your phone uh, like when, when you really need it to. So, so they just want uh, devices that can like, run for really long. And uh, the other part of the quote mentions skipping wide-ranging desktop PC adoption. So um, for a lot of users, um, uh, the first time they ever saw internet was through their mobile phone. And the first time they experienced uh, internet is through the mobile phone. They, it was, for, for most of us, probably it was the desktop, right? And for them, uh, it was not. They just skipped this, uh, this part. And it's not like they are now browsing on the phone for some time, and then they go to their desktop and can view like the better version of the of the website. Unfortunately, uh, most of the people don't have all the way of uh, browsing internet. And um, uh, yes, I had one more point about it, but I'm really tired at this point, and I forgot. <laughs> um, and yes, and uh, there's some statistics that in Nigeria, the, the usage of the, uh, of the internet, almost 75% comes from mobile. So it's like really huge amounts of, uh, of mobile devices using, uh, using the internet. So the conclusion is, like we have two points, and both of them are fulfilled for really loads of users in Africa, which, is, which basically means that everything for them is slow. And if everything is slow, what can we do? Well, we can adjust, adjust our mindset, because um, if everything is slow, you're just used to it, right? And you have a bit more patience. Think of yourself when you're just getting to the internet for the first time, and you wanted to download uh, your favorite um, song, for example, I don't know, what was it, like Alicia Keys or something. And uh, you were like definitely more, um, uh, more prone to wait than you are today. Uh, today, if the song is not buffering, there's like one second delay, you're just really annoyed. And so think about the mindset from back then. Or for example, if, um, if, if you know what it means to live uh, at the outskirts of the city and you just have um, one bus that comes every day, and takes people to the city. If this bus is late by 15 minutes, as long as you know that this bus comes, it's fine, right? But if the metro is late by one minute and you live in a fast-paced city like Tokyo, then you are going to be way more um, hesitant to believe that this metro will come or you think that something is happening. So this is the mindset that we need to have, that there's way more patience. And in such conditions, the bit more important things um, to optimize than uh, taking off like 200 milliseconds of loading time. Because for these users, it's not going to be 200 milliseconds anyway. For them, it makes no difference. There are things that make way more difference, and we're going to talk about them now. So first of all, there's the visibility of system status. You basically want to know uh, what's happening when you're viewing a website. You don't want to stare at the blank screen for too long. And to quote uh, Norman Nielsen Group and uh, one of 10 usability heuristics, uh, the design should always keep users informed about what is going on through appropriate feedback within a reasonable amount of time. So what it means, you want to make sure to give your user information as fast as possible, because this is what's, uh, what will make a difference to them. If you're able to show ugly message about what's going on, it's better than showing beautiful animation without any context, um, basically. That's what I'm saying. So let's, uh, what's what we want to tell them. First, what is going on? The data is syncing. Um, uh, the doc documents are being uploaded. Um, whatever, whatever is that is going on, you should uh, fill in your user. And if possible, also tell them how long it can take so they can be prepared. If you're able to provide the information that really makes sense to them, uh, and not some fake information that will take a few seconds or, or something like that, because then it can really get, uh, be frustrating. Uh, also, you want to let them know once the error occurs and what can be done if it does. For example, you want to tell them um, that they're offline, that uh, they need to refresh the browser, 
that maybe something on your side went wrong or that uh, they should contact uh, the support. And I really like how um, offline Google Maps are doing this, how they are sharing the pieces of information and uh, guiding you through the process. So as you can see, they are, um, or maybe you can't actually, uh, they are telling the user that uh, maybe the download will not contain all the parts of the map because they are they're not available. Or uh, it, it will also mention uh, how much space this download will take and how uh, the download is progressing. And also, after the download is complete, uh, it will tell the user how they can use the maps as well as telling them whenever there is a network connection problem or some other issue um, during the download. But there is one thing to take into account. If you use this in harsh conditions, there is a good chance that they also have a bit less, um, well, their uh, digital literacy may be not on the same level as yours, right? So if you imagine that this person for the first time experienced internet uh, using a mobile a few years ago, um, well, they might not even know what the browser is. For them, there is some, some image on the screen. They tap it, and they're taken to the internet. Or they have a WhatsApp icon, and it takes them to the chat with friends. They might not know like the very basic um, language that, that you're used to on a daily basis. So you want to use a simple language. Another thing is that you want to discourage damaging actions. So for example, uh, if, if uh, if user is using a progressive web app and the data is only syncing, why these people are very, uh, very patient and can wait for things to load for a long time? I saw them also being very curious. So if there's like any shiny buttons on the screen, they are going to be trying to click them because like oh, they're waiting. So why not? Um, so you might want to, for example, uh, prompt them like, "Oh, do you really want to stop the download now?" and uh, maybe not put too many. Uh, too many things around uh, that can break the flow. Uh, second thing is to render initial information as soon as possible. So apart from the, uh, the status of the system, you also probably want to make sure that some initial content is visible for the user so uh, that they can know what is going on quick and maybe, for example, navigate to other parts of, nav uh, parts of the website instead of just uh, waiting for the home screen to load with just the blank screen and a huge loading, uh, loading prompt. Another thing that you can do is, uh, is load parts of the uh, information asynchronously. If you know that some parts of the data uh, might arrive a bit later, just so, to, just, uh, so that you don't block the whole uh, view from the user. Uh, probably another good idea would be to um, introduce some server-side rendering just to offload uh, parts of the um, resolving of what's going on with your JavaScript on user's device that is, well, probably slower than the server where it can be done. But also, it needs testing if, um, if, if the download time, then it's not going to be too long. The first thing I wanted to talk about is to leverage progressive enhancement, which used to be such a buzzword for, for many years ago when I started uh, working on the web. And I felt it died down for some time, and now it's going back. <laughs> so progressive enhancement is basically making it possible to achieve the most crucial actions first for the user, and then adding extra features and fireworks on top of that. We want, we want to give the user the ab ability to uh, explore what they came, to, uh, came for to, to the website. Um, well, if you think logically about it, imagine you're a user and you really need to check the airline website or uh, your bank website or whatever, like do some quick shopping maybe. Um, you don't really care about these animations and all these fireworks that are showing on the, on, the, on the website. I mean, it's nice if it looks good, but you just want to fulfill the prim primary action that, that you came for uh, to the website. Um, and to, uh, to give you an example, this is an image that is available on the Wikipedia's uh, progressive enhancement page, which shows uh, like the bare bones of Wikipedia, where you can just 
well read, uh, access some links, and you're able to achieve what you came for without much additional uh, features. I mean, not that Wikipedia has a lot of them, right? But uh, I think it's a good example. Um, the four things, you want to avoid request chaining and round trips. So as we talked about it, the latency is high. So it's not only for the first uh, request, it's for all the requests that we're making. Uh, so you don't want to uh, like additionally uh, make it longer. So you want to consider uh, using the resource hints. And we're going to talk about three resource hints that can be used. First of them is uh, pre-connect that can help to eliminate the round trips uh, from the request path. And for example, you can establish a connection with the CDN uh, that will be used later. So um, the scenario is that uh, you know that uh, some assets from the CDN that go are going to be needed. You don't know exactly what assets are there. So you just uh, want to establish the connection so that there's no round trip when they are needed uh, to, to get downloaded. And to do that, uh, you need to add the pre-connect um, value for the, for the attribute of rel, as well as the cross-origin attribute. Sorry, it's really dry here. <laughs> um, the next thing is, uh, uh, the next hint is prefetch, which can help you to uh, fetch some, um, some resources ahead of time and then store them in cache. And uh, uh, this, this usually is for the resources that will be needed for the next navigation. Think about, uh, for example, users filling in the form and you know that at the final step of the form there's uh, some sort of image shown or, uh, or any, any asset will be needed. Um, and to add it, uh, also just uh, add the prefetch on the link. A uh, cool thing about it is that the browser is smarter than us, so this is just a hint. And the browser will do whatever it wants about this, but at least will be hinted that there's a need for maybe caching this resource. So caching um, is, uh, is restricted by the amount of data that can be stored and also by how long uh, it can be stored in the cache as well. Um, the third uh, resource hint is preload, which can help you load uh, late discovered resources early. And this is especially uh, useful when, for example, um, well, the best example, and everyone is giving the same one, uh, you have your CSS, and only in the CSS you're referencing the font that is going to be used later uh, on your website, and you want to uh, just let the browser know, OK, like, uh, here's the phone. I know that I'm going to be using it. Otherwise, there might be uh, a flash of unstyled or invisible text uh, if you don't do it. To do that, uh, we need to add the preload uh, flag resource hint. We need to add cross-origin attributes and uh, the type and uh, what sort of resource is that. Um, it needs to be tested as everything with web performance, you need to test this first because if there is no delay for, for your uh, resource to be downloaded, if it's not discovered really late, it might actually be worse because it might result in a double download. Um, so this is definitely something that we don't want. The next thing is to lazy load resources that are not critical. Um, basically, don't force users to download uh, resources that you, they might not ever discover. It's really easy these days uh, because we have the native loading flag that can be set to, to lazy. And it works uh, great in modern browsers with the images. Um, it works with some other types, uh, um, with some other elements uh, in, uh, in certain browsers, but not all of them. So you need to test uh, if it makes sense on other, um, other elements before using this. Learn about network resource hints. So uh, this is about the Network Information API, which helps web applications to access information about the user's network. Um, maybe you saw this, maybe you ever used this. If you have uh, your mobile phone, you can set the 
uh, in the settings, uh, low, low data mode or, or something like that. And basically, we as web developers are able to retrieve information if user has set this flag to true. Uh, it lives in navigator connection save data. I know this link is probably covered for a lot of you, but I'm going to share the slides later, so don't worry about this. Um, and I think it's only um, nice towards the user that if they tell us, like, sorry, I'm in data saving mode, I'm, for some reason, I don't want to use too much data. Maybe data is expensive in the country. Maybe they know that things usually work better if they don't download too much, uh, um, too many assets um, with the website. Then I think it's only uh, nice towards the user to to not send them too much and maybe uh, restrict uh, sending some images or like very heavy assets. Maybe consider sending this um, unenhanced version of the website before progressive enhancement to them. Uh, and this is a really easy way how, can, uh, how we can check if user is having this setting set to true. Next thing is to test for back forward cache. You might not be uh, aware of this, but uh, when user is browsing, modern browsers, now I think all of them, are taking the snapshot of the website that's being browse, uh, browsed. So when the user navigates to uh, somewhere else and then goes back, uh, this snapshot of the website can be immediately retrieved for the user and shown uh, without any delay, without downloading the things again. Um, so if a user clicks on navigation item by mistake, this can minimize uh, the time to navigate back, which is very, very precious for users that have a uh, slow connection, and for them, it usually takes way longer than for us. Unfortunately, you, um, not unfortunately, sorry, browsers are doing this by default. And, uh, um, but unfortunately now, <laughs> there are some things that we are doing uh, with our websites that will prevent browser from taking this snapshot and having the back forward cache in place. And we can test uh, what's going on and if uh, the back forward cache is working really well for, um, for our website, if we open Google DevTools and in the application tab on the left, we have um, the cache section, and in there, there's back forward cache. Then we're prompted with this blue button, and upon clicking it um, for each route on our website, we'll either have successfully served from back forward cache, or there'll be issues, and, um, and the browser will tell us what the issues are and how we can optimize so this uh, snapshotting is working well. I think especially uh, this is an issue for us as like very privileged people when uh, on, for example, shopping websites, when you go to the item and then back and it scrolls you up and there's like you're on all the page or um, the items are not there. So it's not only for users in harsh conditions that is like really annoying when we don't have backward cache. And last but not least, we want to avoid creating too many layers. Uh, so when the browser is trying to serve the user an image and show them um, information on the screen, it usually uh, by default creates one layer. You can think of it as a, like in Photoshop image. And some certain things that we do will create uh, other layers on top of that, um, like other parts of the image. Uh, things that will create layers uh, might be, for example, uh, the wheel change property, um, fixed elements, uh, 3D transforms, um, animating something under fixed elements, and so on and so on. And this is fine. This is browser's optimization. But unfortunately, each layer created by the browser takes device resources and can make uh, the, um, the browsing experience worse for, for some users because if the device has uh, very small computational power, well, uh, the browser can crash. And to test uh, for the amount of the layers that we have um, on our website, we can again go to the DevTools, this free dot menu uh, on the right, uh, in the right corner, then we have more tools and layers down. Uh, and then we have this really, uh, really nice uh, 3D view uh, showing us each, uh, each of the layers. Uh, on the left, uh, we have the, the, uh, all the layers that we have. Probably we don't want to have more than a few, maybe 10. Uh, we can click on each layer, and it will tell us the reason why the layer was created and the memory estimate. 
Um, so we can debug if we have any extra layers that should not be there. To sum up, we want to let user know what is going on early. This is the most important for them to be aware of the situation that they're in and uh, how long they might uh, wait for the content to come in. We want to load initial information early. Don't make user wait for everything to load, because for them, it might take way longer than, than for us. We want to progressively enhance our website, make sure that the user is able to achieve the task that they came for uh, on the website. We want to avoid request chaining and use resource hints if needed because of the huge latency issues. We want to lazy load content below the fault. Don't force the user to download things that should not be there. We want to leverage network information API to be uh, empathetic about what the user is telling us about uh, how much data they want to be sent for. And we want to optimize for back forward cache so that the snapshots of the website can be shown immediately. And we want to consider using service worker, if applicable, as well. I did not talk about this, but uh, if your website is being visited many, many times, um, if it's repeated visits, it might be helpful. And last but not least, avoid using too many layers and repainting a content. I have some links to resources here. Um, I can see some people taking pictures, but I'm going to also um, post this on Twitter so you don't have to try to rewrite this. And gracias.